Ariel, how you doing? Hey, Mark. All right, how are you? Doing good, doing good. Thank you for joining us today. Sure, thanks for inviting me. My yeah, own. No, no problem. Um, I, you know, I got to say, it it stands out. Your experience stands out. You've you've led insurance organizations all over the world, in Munich, in Moscow, here in the United States. And uh, we're seeing a lot of changes in how the contact center space um, in the U.S. and Germany and the U.K. is developing new technologies. I'm curious if you've noticed uh, differences in what's developing here in the U.S. versus what's developing internationally. Um, great question, Mark. I, I think if you ask me this question, let's say five years ago or 10 years ago, I would have uh, given you a completely different answer from what I'm going to tell you now. Um, I think all the trends, uh, whether it's in Russia, in Germany, and you know, in US, they're, they're exactly the same. And, and, and the reason is globalization, right? Um, I, I see it in my daily life, and I'm dealing with insure tax with different companies, with different partners and providers, and they truly become more and more global players, right? They provide solutions in UK, in Germany, and US, and they jump from one Zoom call to another Zoom call, right? With different clients in different parts of the of the world, and and that's you know that leads to the fact that different call center um, environments or, or call center environments or calls in the industry in different parts of the world are benefiting from the same type of solutions and same type of trends. So I remember I was running a call center in Russia. I was in uh, 2010 and 2011. Um, I mean, it was a different world, right? I mean, the labor was super cheap back then, right? The requirements were not that harsh. We didn't have GDPR and all kind of privacy laws and nobody cared back then, right? So we kind of compensated everything with the labor. Um, now, now, like it's, 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 it's different here, right? Now, you know, let's say the Russian call centers are completely up to speed and to the same level of sophistication as I see them being in Germany, right? Or in, in UK or in Philippines or in US. So I think globalization played big role, right? Unexpectedly, but played a huge role on, on call center industry, right? So same, you can now use same tools, same solutions across the globe. And they kind of harmonized and got all up to the same level. Um, you know, and the, I don't see any material changes anymore. It used to be, you know, the, the, the changes, so the difference used to be very material five years ago, seven years ago, 10 years ago. Now they use same CRM tools, they use same, you know, Salesforce, Salesforce of the world, uh, et cetera, et cetera. So that's, that's kind of uh, what, what I see from my perspective. Yeah, how, how incredible is that? It, it's so funny because some will, will be in a, in a deal um, you know, with a potential customer and they'll say, we're evaluating Balto and they're evaluating a UK company and an India company. And, uh, um, you know, the fact that you know, we had those technologies sprouting up all over the world, I feel like is very new. Are there any spaces in particular you feel like that have really accelerated over the last five years? In, uh, in, in terms of solutions, in terms of tools and solutions? Yeah, exactly. I mean, look, I think your company is the best example <laughs> of it, right? Uh, not just not trying to, uh, you know. To, to, hey, I'll to take it. <laughs> but but that's 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 uh, like you know it was a natural evolution, right? I mean, you had first of all it was important to have CRM tools, right? Then it used it was important to have workflow tools. Then everyone was stressing the one-stop solution, right? And now with the last, I want to say three, four years, it's all about data, right? It's all about data. And that leads into AI and to, you know, AI ML topics. And, and that's where you guys, right, play the big, mm -hmm. big role. And right, that's when we got, how we got excited and we said, hey, like you, you, you take your classic solutions in the call center, which is voice, right? And, and take, uh, you know, kind of the data piece and the AI piece of it and put them together and, and then experience a tremendous efficiency boost through it, right? So I, I don't think that call center 
is uh, or you know call center industry or the call center tools or tools that are playing in the call centers uh, uh, are significantly different from what we see uh, in the rest of the insurance industry, right? Whether it's mm-hmm. in underwriting, actuarial claims, um, you know, some parts of IT operations, it's all about data now and it's all about AI, ML, and how do you extract the data and make you know, use of it? Because everyone understands that people, you know, most of the companies are sitting on a tremendous amount of data. Like, big question, right? The $1 million question is how do I get to use it, mm-hmm. right? And uh, I, I think you guys have a little advantage uh, there because most of the companies, if you look into actuarial or, or insurance, right, you need to figure out how do I use your claims? How do I use my historic data, right? From like 20 years ago, from 10 years ago, from two years ago, how do I make it useful? How do I clean the data, uh, et cetera, et cetera. I mean, you guys are using real time data. <laughs> right real time like as i speak yeah. you know you you produce you know you produce the data insights right there and that's that's the amazing part of it right and and i think more and more we will go more and more in those type of solutions like real time ai use of the data or voice right rather than just using you know the mm-hmm. the, the the historic data yeah and Ariel, i think it's getting more and more important to be using uh, data, whatever your data source is in real time, uh, in part because the shelf life of our data, I think is getting shorter and shorter in many ways. Um, what, uh, you know, the, the situation that a bunch of, uh, you know, consumers in the US economy were experiencing a year ago is completely different than the situation that they're experiencing now. And, um, you know, if you were trying to communicate with your customers in a way that you did a year ago, um, a lot of you know, organizations are probably finding that it's not the same and not as effective if you try to apply those those same practices now. Have you noticed any sort of changes in the shelf life of data? Absolutely. I think, you know, generally we're just being overwhelmed by the speed of life now, yeah. right? Everything changes uh, so dramatically fast right so and and i don't know at what point we will you know what's the breaking point right what's the breaking point for us uh you know in in terms of that in terms of that speed uh but i'll I'll give you an example um the voice and i'll try to anonymize it as much as i can uh, without getting into any confidential (laughs) topics but you know there was a point i I mean look in your typical product development cycle right takes I know a year or two, right? That's what it used to be. And it used to be longer, long time ago, but then when we got to one year product development cycle, people were like, wow, wow, that's that's fast. Like, you know, that, that's go-to market speed. That's not good enough anymore. I experienced a situation um, mid in COVID where, you know, one of our business leaders came to us and said, look, there is a, an opportunity for product right based on the data analytics and what we whatever we, else we did there is there is an opportunity for product mm-hmm. if we bring this product to market in the next two three weeks we'll be able to quickly capitalize on it wow okay so but but the point and then you know I, i'm as a cio of the company right and sitting on you know huge portfolio of applications scratch my head and say like how do we do that right um, I mean, it turned out uh, that that product was not really you know, core for us and we didn't go for it. Mm-hmm. But the amazing part of it is that literally three months later, that product became obsolete. And in that window of two, three months, you could have made a lot of money. And after three months, there was nothing else to, to get out there. Um, it was like one of the specialty insurance products, you know, COVID related, you know, mm-hmm. when you fuels your job, blah, 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 we'll compensate for this, this and that, you know, there was a short window of opportunity. I mean, that's, that's now the, you know, the speed, right? Mm-hmm. That's the speed, how we need to act. Like you, you need to quickly be able to quickly react to the market, bring it live in mm-hmm. some sort of non-fancy way, capitalizing it and, and be able to drop it, right? Yeah. And, and move on to the next one. So there, there's reacting to the market and you want to do that quickly. There's putting relevant products out there and you want to do that quickly. Where else is speed um, particularly important 
to insurance businesses today? I mean, everywhere, right? Because it can be a whole part of one value chain, right? It, it doesn't make sense. So, so let's say I always default to that example, like you have a car, right? The car, you have a steering wheel, you have four wheels and you have the frame and the windows, right? You can't say like, hey, the two right wheels go faster than the, <laughs> the, the, the two left wheels, right? Yeah. They have to go at the same speed at the same time in the same direction. Um, so it's it's the same in the, you know, I think, at least in the insurance sector, right, you have, it starts, you start with your, you know, product and your customer journey, right, with the customer buying something, right, and then in going into servicing and then into claims. So all of those pieces need to kind of accelerate, right, and mm-hmm. innovate and, and bring stuff to the market. Because, you know, the example that I gave you on the product side, um, like, Okay, so we sold the product, but then you know, then you would you should have thought at the same time, how do I service it, right? And how do I do claims? And how, like, how do I bring my people in call center to answer those calls, right? Because you know, if I sell a product, I guarantee you the next day or the same day I will get a call from a customer, either happy or unhappy customer. And my people in the call center need to be able on the fly to learn the product, learn and understand the product, and be able to answer questions. And in case they don't know the answer, they need to know how to react, mm-hmm. right? And for that, you need tools that quickly go through your entire, you know, universe, right? Um, and 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 so that you can 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 you know react to 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 those type of things. Yeah, that seems like such a huge logistical challenge. Where not only do you need to get each part of the business moving fast, but each part of the business needs to move fast in unison. And, um, you know, putting the uh, people behind that to make that happen and the process behind that to make that happen um, seems incredibly difficult. You know, are, are you changing how you manage or how you lead or how people work together in your organization so everyone is working fast and in unison? Or do you find that the uh, tactics that you, you may have used in the way that you've learned to lead and manage uh, five years ago still largely apply today? So I'll give you maybe, you know, two buzzwords, right? As, as an answer, and I'll try to elaborate on, on it a little bit. Everything changed. So, so nothing is the same because I remember how I was running, you know, my call center or operations, you know, 10 years ago and five years ago and, and nothing of that stayed the same. And besides the typical metrics, right? That you attract the SLAs, the, you know, the abandoned calls, the HTs, et cetera, et cetera, you know. Um, but, but um, you know, the management style need, needed to be adapted, right? And, and the leadership style and how you bring people together. Because everything used to be more or less silent back then, right? Now everything needs to be like a, you know, nice, perfect Swiss watch, right? When you look into, when it, if you ever look at the mechanism, like a, like a Swiss watch, it's just amazing. Amazing how people, are. it's beautiful. So and it has to, to, to be exactly the same and, and what we do now. Um, so, so the two buzzwords that I wanted to give you initially, one is, you know, the typical goal setting, which is plain vanilla. You need to be very clear with your people on your vision and your goal setting, right? You need to be able to articulate very clearly on, on what do you want from them? How do you want them to function? And also lead as a role, as a role model, right? So that, that part, hasn't really changed in the last five years or 10 years, right? It's been always there. The second word is, is, a, true, is, is a buzzword, but this is something relatively new, agile transformation, right? So we started a journey three years ago. I know many other companies started much earlier, but for us, it started kind of three years ago. And that's the answer you know, for the speed. Right? That's where you completely change your mentality. Right? It's, it's a change, it's, it's a shift, right? In mentality and culture. Hey, we are not waterfall. We don't want to do paralysis analysis for two years in order to come up with an idea that it will take me two months to implement. And then I go into never ending warranty period and whatever else. Now it's like, hey, define the idea, architect it, size it, implement like in a dynamic way, right? Repeated way. And some people might say, yeah, but agile transformation is a buzzword for IT, right? Technology, it is not, it is not. It applies to each and everyone in enterprise, 
where it falls through the cracks when people believe it's just the IT, like, you know, the product, the business, the underwriting, the whoever can stay the same the old way, but IT needs to become agile. So guess what? IT or operations cannot become agile without partners. Um, so so th that changed. That changed big time. Where do you think the next big application of Agile is? The, the IT space is an, is an easy first one. Uh, where else is, where's the next target where businesses should think about you know, how they can be more Agile and use more Agile methodologies? Mark, this is where I would respectfully disagree with you a little. I don't think that IT is the first place to do Agile, right? Uh, I, I think you... The agile in IT will only work if the enterprise becomes more agile, right? So as you implement agile, you, you cannot say like, hey, the business takes like, I don't know, three years to come up with an idea, right? But it will work with it. And then you expect IT to iterate in weekly sprints, right? Or bi-weekly sprints. It needs, you need to have those business people in your sprints as your product owners, as your scrum masters, as whatever, right? And, and they need to adapt that mentality as well. So I, when you go for agile transformation, you have to kind of start pulling them in from the beginning. It, it is difficult. And, you know, you know, in the beginning, you will be failing, but you need to just keep trying. Mm -hmm. what, one of the things that I think um, is probably, you know, top of mind when people are thinking of agile in any way, shape or form is the very quick loops of iteration between, you know, uh, conceptualizing something and executing it and deploying it. Um, and I think one of the things we've also seen is that uh, with the change to remote, um, in some ways, those loops have gotten shorter because a lot of things that were previously meetings can are now handled over Slack or something like that. But in a lot of ways, it's tough to get a hold of people sometimes. And, um, you know, that makes it more difficult um, to, to have those quick um, you know, loops of, of iteration. Um, you know, what are the, the ground rules for doing Agile well um, in an organization, in a culture, when at least right now, you know, uh, most people in organizations are probably remote? I don't think, you know, I mean, I don't know maybe some people have different experiences. I don't think the remote has changed anything, right? I don't think, yes, I mean, of course it changed something, right? It changed, you know, the, the human psyche, right? And, uh, being people That's being sure. you know, remote for like 10, 11 months now or 12 months uh, or whatever, you know, the count. I lost the count right now, but- uh, No need it, to count. It, right? <laughs> it, it, it has certain impact on people, but in terms of pure agile, it, it doesn't really matter. So I think as long as you, as long as you establish the, the ground rules and the guardrails, right? And again, mm -hmm is you are, you know, you kind of establishing leaders in, in those agile teams that can be the role models and you establish the goals, right? You can keep iterating like on your cycle time, on your throughput, on your quality, then it doesn't really matter. I mean, I, I have not seen nothing but improvement in kind of agile speed in, in, in the last 11 months uh, mm -hmm. for, for my teams. We've noticed a lot of that too. And I, I think uh, what you mentioned a few minutes ago about goal setting is particularly important there. And that if you have a good goal with a good deadline and clear deliverables, uh, doesn't matter whether you're remote or not, uh, your team is going to be iterating quickly to get to that goal. What I think uh, may have gotten harder, and, and this is what, what I've experienced, is that um, you know a lot of the times when you haven't set the goal yet, uh, but you are trying to get quick feedback from your team on what is going well and what is not going well and address issues quickly. Um, you know, we used to do that over lunch. We used to go and do an all you can eat sushi buffet and sit there for two hours and talk about the product. And, uh, and that opportunity is not there anymore. So, um, you know, for your business, have, have you noticed any effects there? The uh, missing lunch effect or the missing cocktail effect? Or has that just kind of uh, evened out with all the change that's been happening in the world? No, I mean, that, there's definitely something that's been missing out, yeah. right? And, and, and I feel it. I mean, I personally feel it. 
I, I see it uh, with my teams. I hear it from them, right? I mean, my, you know, I have very vocal f- folks that they are, you know, kind of phrasing it. And I know some people started to go into the offices, right? I mean, our op- most of our offices are ghost towns now, but there are some people that, you know, kind of want that type of interaction. I mean, of course you, you lose out. You still have, you know, the Zoom, so the Teams, I maybe mean, use Teams, Microsoft Teams for communication. and. And uh, our people are constantly sitting on, you know, in chats and video calls, you know, video conferences, uh, trying to interact. They, they organize for some virtual lunch, lunches or some catch-ups, um, but nothing will replace, you know, personal mm-hmm. <laughs> interaction in, in the office. Uh, and that's why we're looking forward, you know, to get back. Uh, that's one of the better. <laughs> Um, but uh, yeah, pe- people are missing out, and you can see it on their mood. You can see a little bit on how the productivity fluctuates. I mean, nothing terrible, right? I mean, in the beginning it went big time up, but the productivity went up because everyone did it despite, right? Despite what happened, mm-hmm. you know, we were like proving to everyone else and to ourselves we can do it, and we proved it, right? But then you like, kind of you have this like flattening out, um, you know, impact. Uh, or mom, you know, face, and then you come and then it fluctuates a little bit up and down, up and down. So that's that's where the leadership, you know, comes in. And that's where I expect my my team to, you know, portray the leadership to their folks, to their teammates, and say, hey, this is how we do it. This is how we manage ourselves, and this is, you know, uh, how we should uh, behave in this type of situation. Um, and everyone is just trying to do their best now, right? Until we can get back. They are. It, it's such a good point. You know, a few weeks ago, Balta had our, our fourth anniversary party and we're bringing everyone on Zoom and we're doing this big anniversary party on Zoom. And we had a, a 15 minute break in between activities on Zoom and everyone kind of turned off their camera and muted, but a couple people stayed on and chatted. And, uh, you know, while I was out of the room, so to speak, um, I, I heard some folks talking about uh, someone said, you know, honestly, I just, I can't take this anymore. I can't take remote. I don't know if I can stand one more day like this. And um, I, I heard that individual say it and was like, man, uh, there is a long-term impact of, you know, being remote that I think has not gotten uh, nearly as much attention as perhaps it should. Uh, absolutely. It's, it's interesting. You know, it's an interesting observation. I, I had very similar, like in the beginning, First two, three months, as I told you, as we were doing this despite, and people kind of enjoy it, right? Staying yeah. at home with their families. I mean, to a different degree, right? I mean, some people hate it, but, but many people enjoy it, right? Even the family, it's so convenient. You don't need to commute, you know, you don't like no traffic, no whatever, right? People being very, very productive. But then, you know, the, the more we went into it, the, the more people started to hear that, you know, they, they, they want to get back. But also in the same time in the beginning, relatively in the beginning, I want to say true summer, people were like, hey, we don't need to get ever back to the offices and he's sticking you know, his Amtrust going to allow us to stay permanently at home, right? So, but now you, you don't hear these questions anymore. People are like, uh, p- people don't want to stay permanently at home anymore. And, and I think what's going to happen is, you know, most of the companies will end up with some sort of hybrid model, mm-hmm. right? Uh, where you will have to accommodate for some time, you know, work from home, but where you will mandate for some people to come back into the offices, especially if you have newbies, like you, you have, you know, college grad, right? Just came out, never had a corporate job, you know, gets hired by company X, let's say Amtras or whoever, right? Like how does he learn company's culture? How does he get to acquire the expertise that he needs to, mm-hmm. the feeling for, you know, some numbers, for process, for the data? Like, how do you do that all remotely? Like, if you've been in the industry and a job for 20 years, I, I, I get it. You know it, right? But you, you, could, you always had someone you can go to and ask a question and consult. But someone new to the company, to the process, to the industry, like, how do you do that over Zoom or Teams? Do any principles come to mind for how you all are handling it at Amtrust? In the newbie who is trying to learn your culture, learn your industry, learn your lingo, make relationships, build a network, start a career. 
remotely? I mean, there are, uh, look, the, the, the best principle is do your best, right? Do your best because it's hard. Like there's no, what I call, I don't know whether it's the right, you know, uh, saying in English, you know, the, the shoulder feeling, right? Where, where you, you sit next to, you, you know, next to a colleague and you, you, you have this shoulder feeling. You feel like who he is, you know, how to trust him. That's how you learn. It's right now, it's just like what we are telling our people, just be accommodating, right? You know, check in regularly, be accommodating, ask mm-hmm. if someone needs help. But I think the best, the best thing for those people, for the newbies, will be to be in the office, at least for some time. Mm-hmm. That's the learning process. And then you can go back. You can be more remote, you know, if needed. For the, for the economy in general, the broader economy, um, you know, I think that, um, you know, a lot of us are feeling how, um, you know, we are changing our mindsets and our attitudes based on the remote work. But how are customers in general, how are consumers in general, you think, changing their mindsets in terms of you know how they buy and what they expect from companies that they work with? I, I think you know the trend has been there. It's not a new trend. It's not a, just a COVID trend. I mean, everyone is trying to be more remote, right? More digital and less in person. I mean, you can see the impact on certain industries, like you know, brick and mortar. Um, stores right i mean see how many of them are closing down or closed down or went bankrupt right because they're losing out to digital economy right and then trying to be you know more remote i mean i don't remember when i was the last time in chase bank right i mean i just like i uh, there's no need right everything is remote or in digital like you know app this and that and 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 that's what i think people are trying to do more and more I think it's well come with a generational, right? With a generation shift, right? I mean, there's, you still have people and I still see some of our clients insisting on paper invoice, right? Or insisting that they can only pay with a check or they only mm-hmm. want to pay with a check. But the, the, I, I want to say three years ago, four years ago, that was half of our customers. Now it's maybe 25%. So you see how quickly it went down. And it'll go more and more down. It's the same, you know, it's Mark, it's the same question for the call centers, right? Will the call centers survive? You now, five years ago, visionary people were saying, oh, you know, there will be no call centers. Everything will be through app and chatbots. You don't need you don't need the call center anymore. And I, I don't I don't agree with those with that opinion. I think you will always have a call center because there are always people that want you know, human voice, right? They want to talk to someone, they want to be helped with. Um, and, and that's, uh, you see the more digital trends, but I, I don't think, I don't think, you know, the offices will go away. I don't think the brick and mortar will be 100% away. I don't think call centers will go away. I mean, it's such a, you know, such a big part of our, you know, of, 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 our, of our life. One of the things I think we see is that uh, technology produces massive efficiencies and this move toward digital um, is making everything more efficient where you can get a lot of your questions answered very quickly online or, or through chat or, you know, whatever medium uh, that you are using. Um, but, you know, if you take the most iconic retail store of the 21st century and you look at the Apple store that's selling, you know, uh, massive amounts of, of product per square foot, and now you have a model where people are saying, let's as efficiently as possible exchange the goods with the, pe- the visitors. Um, you're missing out on that experience that Apple did a great job of creating of people walking around the store, playing with the products, getting to know the products, uh, seeing the Apple geniuses and feeling like uh, you had a good support and backup. So I think that there's this massive uncovered opportunity to think about you know, with the contact center um, how can we uh, put people in the contact center in a way that is mimicking what Apple did in, in brick and mortar? Uh, uh, yeah, I'll, I'll uh, abs- I absolutely agree with you. I, th- this is the core, right? I, I'm not a big fan. I'm not a big believer, you know, of, of extreme solutions, right? Everything will get uh, digital. Oh, no, everything needs to go just to a call center or everyone needs to go in the brick and mortar. It's always a healthy 
balance of solutions, right? That satisfy different target groups, a few customers, you know, you, and and it, 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 I cannot exp I cannot describe how annoying it is when I can't find a phone number to call in for you know, hey, there's a company, it's a vendor, or you know, uh, I don't know, a logistical company. I want to call out names here, or you know, shipping company, or you know, telecom company, and, and, and you're desperate. Something is not working. You're desperate, and you're looking, look for the number, and they're trying. They they do a good job hiding that number, and they let you run through the loops of their bots and IVR and whatever else, and you can never get to him. It's super annoying, right? And that makes me sometimes drop that, you know, service. Mm -hmm. and, and and rather than just being that extreme, I 100% I agree with you, right? It's all about creating that healthy balance saying, hey, you have this channel, you have that channel, you have that channel. Let's make sure that the experience in those channels is similar, right? Or, I mean, superb. Right, rather than saying, hey, no, 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 like uh, you only can go to the chat, right? And we don't care if you go a hundred times in, in the loop and don't get your solution, right? Uh, you know, there needs to be health. And that's why, like, when we uh, deployed, you know, we deployed virtual IVR, we deployed um, chatbot, right? We deployed, li you know, live bot, we, but we always accommodate, like, hey, if we don't want you to get frustrated, we don't want you to get stuck, you can always loop out and get into the contact center or into live chat support so that you have, you know, that you feel like a valued customer, right? And then it comes down to equipping those people in the contact center with all the possible tools, right? We can mm. talk forever about one-stop solution, right? Or one-call solution, but that needs tools, right? You need to equip your people, with, I don't know, FAQs with CRMs, you know, Balto ideal is a, <laughs> is a part of your tool set or anyone's tool set. But uh, I mean, you need to position your folks to create that, you know, great customer experience. Ariella, to sign us off, what does the contact center of 2030 look like in your mind? What I just described, Mark, uh, I mean, to me, uh, I don't see contact centers going away. To me, contact centers of 2030 are, you know, you know, full of qualified, happy customer service representatives, equipped with great tools to create great customer experience, right? For the people that that feel that they would like to talk to a human being, and be treated like a human being. Ariel, thank you so much for your time. This was wonderful. Yeah, thank you, Mark. See you too. Talk to you soon. Bye.